Right. Um, our teacher is Rilitsa Masson. Uh, she recently started her uh, own lab in Dundee. Rulitz's work has focused a lot on uh, studying cell signaling dynamics and, and time. Um, we recently were introduced and uh, kind of uh, really appreciated her rigorous approach to validating antibody measurements and her careful approach to science. She actually serves on a committee for scientific integrity. And I'm excited to see her take uh, this rigorous approach to um, quantifying protein measurements and, and learn more about her uh, studies of cell signaling. Thanks a lot, Andrew, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Nikolai, for the fantastic opportunity to be here. I've really enjoyed this conference uh, meeting, uh, especially the uh, focus on collaboration, community building, and last but not least, the development of rigorous workflows. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of geography because it turns out a lot of people don't actually know a what Dundee is, where it is. So it's right here in Scotland, in the UK. And as Andrew did mention or maybe didn't mention, I'm based at the MRC protein phosphorylation and ubiquitylation unit, which you can simply call MRC PPU. But as the name suggests, you can probably guess we are particularly excited about post-translational modifications. And so in other words, we are uh, cell signalers. Now, um, for the first half of my sort of um, fairly short scientific career, I was particularly excited about using proteomics, transcriptomics, and various omics technologies to build uh, signaling networks and understand how pietri kinase signaling goes wrong in uh, disease. Um, more recently, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, I decided that a hybrid approach was probably a bit uh, healthier because it turns out that there are certain aspects of biology that we simply cannot get to with our current omics technologies. And so I'll be talking about very basic signaling today, uh, looking at a few markers at the time, uh, but hopefully I'm going to convince you uh, that as Olga said yesterday, sometimes uh, looking at a few things, but looking at the right things and quantifying them the right way can really provide us with a lot of insights. Now, um, the goal of my lab really is to map what I call the Piatri kinase signaling code uh, in health and disease. And this interest uh, really goes back to a paradox that implicates a key human gene known as PIK3CA. I bet that the majority of you have heard about PIK3CA one way or another because it is one of the most frequently mutated oncogenes. So you take any cancer you like, and most often what you'll find is that uh, there is a PIK3CA mutation. What most people do not know, and that's where my background actually is, uh, is that the exact same activating pic 3 same mutations that are found in cancer are also the cause of a group of rare but highly debilitating non-cancerous overgrowth disorders. And so this challenge is the one drug, one target, uh, one disease paradigm uh, that forms the basis for much of current drug development in oncology and beyond. And the question that I'm particularly interested in answering uh, is how can the same pic 3 ca perturbation give rise to entirely different outcomes? And it's really important for me to say that all of the questions that we're addressing in the lab are actually inspired by observations that we're making in the human disease and patients that you're seeing here. Okay. Um, why is this important? Apart from the diseases that we're looking at here, PIK3CA is at the core of the PF3 kinase signaling pathway, and that's an important pathway in all human cells. So PIK3CA, for those of you who are not PF3 kinase signaling aficionados, um, is the gene that codes for the catalytic P1 and alpha subunit of the PF3 kinase alpha enzyme. PF3 kinase alpha is a heterodimer, it's got a catalytic subunit and a regulatory subunit. And essentially, it is required for signaling downstream of virtually every single receptor tyrosine kinase that you can think of. And it sits up here, it gets activated, and then it generates a second messenger. And that second messenger is a phosphorylated lipid, not a phosphorylated protein. It's PIP3, and PIP3 nucleates a very complex phosphorylation cascade. And most of the time, we tend to be focusing on a couple of effectors, notably AKT and mTORP1 as the key ones downstream of PIP3. But the reality is much more complex, and it's really, really important to remember that there is much more to get kinase signaling than just AKT and mTORP1. What's also really important to remember is that this pathway is incredibly complex in its operation. So depending on when and where you look in the cell, uh, it will exhibit very uh, distinct and non so-called nonlinear dynamics. Unfortunately, this complexity is often forgotten, uh, it particularly um, might offend somebody, but particularly in oncology circles and sort of drug development circles, the pathway tends to be viewed as somewhat of a binary switch that can either be on or it can be off. And so if you've got a tumor with a pic 3 ca mutation, the assumption often is that this pathway is just on all the time. And so logically, it follows that a way to treat this would be to 
make a drug that can flip the switch off again, and it will flip it off all the time. And so that's the basis for some of the drug development that has taken place over uh, the last decade. One of the uh, most relevant drugs in this space at the moment is Opalisafe or BYL719 or Picray or Bejoice, whichever name you prefer. It inhibits PI3 kinase alpha, and it was in approved for clinical use uh, about five years ago now. So, okay, success. Oh, that's what you may think. But in reality, the success has been hampered by very limited efficacy and very high toxicity which should not be a surprise um, based on this, because the PA3 kinase pathway is essential for the normal function of all of our cells. And so it makes sense that cells don't like it if you turn it off, especially if you turn it off all the time. Uh, it's also not a surprise uh, if you think about how this pathway functions. It's not a switch, and you can choose your own metaphor. Mine is inspired by my mother country, Bulgaria, where accordions are a common thing. I don't play one, but an accordion can be used to play the same music in different ways. And similarly, the output of any given PS3 kinase signaling perturbation is highly dependent on context, that being cell type, developmental stage, environment, mutational status, and quantitative parameters, such as the strength and the pattern of the signal. And so a few years ago, my own work led to the hypothesis that the quantitative signaling thresholds may determine the pathophysiological consequences of genetic PS3 kinase alpha activation. And so since then, my goal has been to map the quantitative thresholds and to identify the mechanisms that lead their existence. More fundamentally, this is a question about specificity in biochemical signal transduction. So the function of a signaling pathway is to transfer information and to transfer information about, in this case, the external environment reliably. And yet we're dealing here with a common set of molecular effectors. So this is what I call the hardware, which we have been studying for 30 years now. We know it very well. And yet we still don't know much about the software. So how all these different inputs that acts through a common set of molecular components give rise to uh, a variety of um, uh, distinct and specific phenotypic uh, outputs. And so one of the reasons we haven't made as much progress in on this side of the equation is because of technological limitations. And so remember what I said earlier, the output of PI3 kinase activation is not a phosphorylated protein, it's a phosphorylated lipid. And yet I would argue it's absolutely essential if you want to understand how information is encoded in this pathway that you start off with the immediate output. And so it's incredibly difficult to detect this phosphoinositide lipid because it's found in small amounts in the cell, it's found within the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And so not only is it difficult to detect just in bulk, but it's also incredibly difficult to detect if you want to measure this at the single cell level. And what I'll try to convince you about today is the fact that you cannot calculate or measure how much information is transferred in the signaling system unless you have single cell data. We, of course, don't just want to be measuring this 3 We also want to be measuring some of these downstream effectors, and that becomes even more complex because now you're looking at multiple uh, modalities at the same time. So. Three and a half years ago, when I started my postdoctoral fellowship at UCL um, Cancer Institute in Bart and Heisenberg's lab, my initial goal really was to overcome the technical challenges that were preventing us from measuring uh, PI3 kinase information transfer. And so I set out to develop a single cell framework for quantification of PI3 kinase dependent information transfer. Now, most of this work is now available um, on BioArchive. If my reviewers on the audience, whoever is taking five months to review this paper, would you please send it back? But in essence, it is out there. It's undergoing peer review, and hopefully soon we'll be able to add some of the additional data. Um, I will be talking uh, about some of the biology, of course, that we identified, but I'll be going through uh, several of the methods um, that I've developed. Um, a lot of those are hopefully accessible uh, because we've shared all the protocols and data sets and code, et cetera, but please, if anything is missing, do uh, let us know. Um, the technologies uh, that I work with fall into sort of two categories, microscopy and then mass cytometry. Now, in order to measure, oh, this is where Windows and Mac of issues, but essentially the technology that um, I use to measure the immediate output of PI3 kinase activation, so the phosphoinositide PIP3, and minor technical detail, it's derivative PI3 4P2, it's total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy, turf microscopy. And so the trick here is that you shine the laser light onto your sample at a so-called critical angle, which results in total internal reflection. As a result of this total internal reflection, you get this evanescent field so that if you have a fluorescent reporter in the cell, 
the molecules that are excited are only those that are immediately adjacent to the cover slip. And if you're looking at a cell, that would be your plasma membrane at the bottom, uh, at the bottom of the cell. And so what we can use here are various reporters that have been developed um, on the basis of effector proteins that detect PIC3. So for example, AKT has a plexin homology domain that allows it to be recruited to the plasma membrane when PIX3 is generated, but there are others as well. And so when I started this, it wasn't entirely clear which one of these reporters would be best for highly quantitative measurements. And so I set out to benchmark these and set up a quantitative assay that would allow me to measure PIP3 at high resolution, both temporarily, but also at the single cell level. And so to cut a long story short, a lot of optimization went into this, and it's all in the paper, but the pH domain of AKT2 in my hands is the best reporter to use for this, both in terms of reproducibility across experiments, but also in terms of dynamic range. A really important trick here, if anybody's interested in these types of assays, is to express an orthogonally tagged mutant version of this protein. So this mutant version cannot bind the phosphoinositide, but it has a fluorophore that is orthogonal to this one. And it's absolutely essential because it allows you to control for artifacts that are very common when you're measuring things in TERP because it's not confocal. You can discuss those in the questions if anybody's interested. So that's how we can measure PIP3. For the downstream, we can also measure AKT activity using very standard approaches, kinase transplication before the RAFI in this case. Uh, one of the key substrates of AKT is FOXO, so you can take bits and pieces of FOXO, uh, infuse them to a fluorescent protein, and now this reporter uh, translocates in and out of the nucleus as a function of its phosphorylation status. And this particular version of the uh, AKT KTR is the most specific that is out there at the moment. So again, if anybody is interested in using these approaches, go for the most recent version of the reporter because it's much more specific for AKT than what's out there uh, otherwise. This is not particularly technically challenging. You just need a white foot microscope and a projective. You get lots of cells and data. This is much more challenging. So in terms of uh, throughput, uh, the TERP assay, we typically measure cells, uh, PIP3, uh, every 70 seconds up to one hour. Um, we have, I have optimized the setup in a DIY fluidic setup that allows us to actually have four conditions at the same time, uh, which allows for extra control and we capture 40 to, 40 to 60 single cells per experiment. With the kind of replication assay, we capture um, AKT activity every six minutes. We can do it for hours, for minutes, whatever. Uh, the experiment requires, we've done it for 48 hours. Um, here we get 4,000 to 10,000 single cells per experiment. It depends a bit on the density of the seeding. And so this is what it looks like in practice. Let's see if it plays, yeah. So this is your turf, stimulating with IGF or EGF, and you get the reporter recruited uh, to the plasma membrane. This is the kinase translocation reporter assay. Here we've got a false coloring for AKT activity. And again, when you add a growth factor, you see uh, the response go up. So that's all fine, and we can quantify this fairly easily with uh, semi-automated and automated analysis pipelines. So this is great. It gives you a lot of temporal resolution, but obviously I'm sure you can spot already what the limitations are. We're working in uh, 2D. We're capturing individual markers separately, not at the same time in the same cell, and we have to actually introduce exogenous reporters in order to be making these measurements. So there's always the worry that we're dealing with some sort of technical artifact. So what I really wanted was a third, an orthogonal assay to complement these ones, not replace them. It would allow me to measure P3 kinase signaling activity at the single cell level, but capturing additional markers beyond uh, PIP3 and AKT, and also at a higher throughput without the need for exogenous reporters. And so it's a bit of a shame that Chris Tate could make the meeting because he would have introduced this technology before me, but this is basically the mass cytometry, cytometry approach that I'm using. And um, the power of the approach really comes from, from the tape labs barcoding technology, which allows us to multiplex 126 samples into one uh, with this approach. So here I start with generating uh, size controlled scaffold free spheroids. I've written HeLa here, but we've actually done this with a variety of other cell lines, including induced protein stem cells and mouse embryonic stem cells. Uh, these plates for the spheroid generation are commercially available, and each well in this 96 well plate has 79 micro wells. And in each micro well, you have a spheroid and it's size controlled. Um, each well is now an independent experimental condition. And the key thing to any signaling analysis, and this is really, really important, is that you want to preserve the state of the cells 
at the point at which you finish your perturbation, not after dissociation. So you have to fix in situ in this particular case, or if you're doing it by proteomics, you snap freeze, but you do not dissociate the cells and then uh, do signaling. I'm emphasizing this because sometimes it is actually forgotten. And if you do dissociate, especially with trypsin, you're gonna be measuring the effects of your dissociation and not of the perturbation that you're interested in. So we fix the cells in situ, and then we perform barcoding. And the trick of this technology, the Tobis technology by the Tape Lab, it's published, um, is basically that you've got pyoreactive chemicals that are conjugated to uh, a variety of uh, heavy metal isotopes, which you can mix in different combinations up to 126. And so we can have up to 126 distinct conditions. Once we've barcoded the spheroids, we can pull them into one, and then we need to dissociate them into single cells. And now this is really difficult because we fix them. And so I was at the point of abandoning this technology altogether until on Twitter one day, I discovered this little machine, it's called a tissue grinder. And it said that uh, it's capable of dissociating tissues non-enzymatically for three minutes. I thought it was too good to be true, but at that point I was giving up anyway. And so I gave it a go and it actually worked. So um, we now, the problem we had with everything else I was trying was that I was actually destroying the uh, epitope. So I was losing uh, protein that was leaking out of the cells. And so with this now, it's super easy because basically uh, the, the rest of the workflow is like any flow cytometry-based staining that you do. Instead of having uh, fluorophores conjugated uh, to your antibody, you have heavy vessels. And so you can profile this by mass cytometry. Now, this is my very unimpressive antibody panel. And the reason it is tiny is because I really think that it's important to validate these antibodies for every single type of system that you really are working with. It's incredible how many of these are actually not validated generally and actually threw out quite a lot just because they were not working the way they were supposed to be working. And so just a warning, basically, just because they're used in the published literature, I would advise people not to trust them unless you, you validate. And so even though it's a small subset, I do have uh, a few markers, PTMs, um, for uh, my pathway of interest, but also the RASMAP connect signaling pathway, TGF beta signaling, and importantly, also cell state. This is important because um, I'll show you what happens once you look at cells that are cycling versus non-cycling. So this is an example data set from the cytos. So you get these histograms. Don't worry about the color coding for now. Uh, but this is a typical experiment, 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes of IGF-1 stimulation, looking at phosphorus 6, serine 240, serine 244, and M1 activity marker. And uh, this is how it works in cells that are cycling and happy, as expected there's a response. This is what happens in the cells that are non-cycling. There's no response. There's literally no growth factor in induced signaling in the non-cycling uh, cells. Uh, this is not unique to our system, actually. If you're interested in this, Lucas Pelkic's lab had a paper in Science a couple of years ago uh, where they're reporting a similar phenomenon in a completely different system. Tape lab is seeing this all the time in their organoid model. So I really think it's just one other example of how important it is to have the single cell resolution and to take cell state into account, even in a homo otherwise homogeneous uh, system. Uh, granted, spheroids are more complex than 2D culture, but nevertheless, um, so this was particularly striking, striking for me at least um, to see. Okay, just one example of the type of information that we get from these data, but we get so much more because, as I mentioned earlier, we have the high temporal resolution uh, from the light cell microscopy, which now allows us to really accurately quantify how information flows within the Pietri kinase signaling pathway. And so I'll come back to the turf with some actual data now. And so what I'll be showing you here are uh, data sets or signaling traces, uh, looking at uh, Pietri kinase activity at the level of bit three generation on the x-axis time um, and on the y-axis, the normalized reporter response is the biosensor. And here are just example data from uh, HeLa cells that are either wild type for pic 3 ca or engineered with CRISPR to express either one or two copies of the most common pic 3 ca variant. I have chosen them for a particular reason, but we've actually also done these experiments in human-induced peripotent stem cells and also in uh, non-human uh, cell lines, uh, at least the ones with the wild type pic 3 ca um, Oh, great. Um, Mac Windows conversion issue, so it's not going to show you any places whatsoever. Can we put my computer on? Yeah. Yeah, because otherwise you're not going to see anything. <laughs> I mean, you could trust me if I tell you what the traces look like. I can draw them by this point, but um, 
Oh. Actually, I do, I do, I do, I do. Now you will be in suspense about how information is transferred through the PO3 kinase signaling pathway for a bit. Um. <laughs> Reporting in progress. Um, screen sharing is disabled. Okay. Cool. There are pots. Um, okay, so this was turf, and we're looking at PIP3 responses in live cells. And I would like you to focus on the black traces uh, to begin with. So the black traces are from cells with pic 3 ca uh, wild type expression. And uh, you see here what I've, that, that what I've done is stimulate cells with either IGF-1 or EGF across uh, increasing doses from one nanomolar to 10 nanomolar to 100 nanomolar. Now, if you had all the time in the world, if you don't, you would have noticed eventually. But what, what's really different here is the kinetics. So you can distinguish IGF-1 from EG, EGF in the wild type cells simply by looking at the temporal trajectory. But you can also distinguish the different doses of the growth factor simply by looking at the, uh, at the temporal trajectories, just looking at PIP3 here and nothing else. We can actually quantify this because here I'm just showing you summaries, uh, summary traces, which doesn't really do the data uh, enough justice because it's all obtained at the single cell level. And that allows us to use mathematical information theory to quantify how much uh, the PI3 kinase protein, how much information the PI3 kinase a protein is transmitting for each one of these growth factors. So information theory was developed uh, for analyzing man-made communication systems, and it's basically asking the question, in the presence of noise, how much information is transmitted reliably? And a signaling system is um, a, a basically essentially a communication channel with noise. And so what we're asking here, uh, if you could see all the single cell distributions, is how distinct are they from one another for the different inputs. But we can do more than just that, because we don't just have snapshot measurements, we have the whole trajectory. So we can now quantify information transfer reliably within the PIA3 finance pathway by taking into account these trajectories obtained at the single cell level. And so I worked together with a fantastic mathematician at the University of Exeter in the UK to do this, Margarita Boliotis, and these are the results. So essentially, information is quantified in bits. And so if you're asking the question, are wild type cells able to transmit reliably these three doses of IGF-1, then the maximum information in bits would be 1.5. And so we see that we're getting pretty decent uh, information transfer for IGF-1 through the PI3 kinase channel. The same is not true for EGF. And remember, here it may look as if they're very, well, not very, but somewhat distinct. But what information theory takes into account is the noise, so the uh, heterogeneity uh, in the response across individual cells. Um, it's not surprising that less information is transferred through PI3 kinase uh, downstream of EGF because EGF is a fairly poor activator of the PI3 kinase pathway. And so you need to take responses like RASMAP kinase into account, for example. Now, I really want to make a very important point here, which is that if we have done these calculations from snapshot measurements, so let's say I decided to calculate uh, the information at time point 20 minutes without taking the trajectory into account, you vastly underestimate the amount of information that is transferred through the signaling pathway. And so uh, it is inaccurate. So you need not only single cell resolution to perform these calculations accurately, but you absolutely need time. And so that's why I keep banging on about time as an important dimension to consider. 
Okay, I told you to just look at the black traces for now, but I'm sure some of you will have noticed that the orange and the red traces look different than the black ones. Of course, those are the traces uh, in the presence of the pic 3 ca H1047R mutation. And I hope that what you've noticed is that you don't just have constitutive on activity, yes, you have high baseline activation, but there is an additional response when you add uh, the growth factor. And in fact, if you look at how uh, the presence of the mutation affects information transfer, you'll notice that selectively for IGF-1, not for EGF, the pic 3 ch 47 r variant reduces information transfer, the fidelity of information transfer, okay? So you can sort of see it already here because the cell is no longer able to sense the lower concentration of IGF-1. It is fine, relatively speaking, uh, for EGF. Now, we can look at this for the downstream of the level of AKT. And here is uh, the type of data that we get when we're using the AKT kinase translocation reporter, which is much more scalable, much more high throughput. And here we can compare other growth factors. So like insulin, we can include epigen. But those of you who are not EGF signaling, sort of expert time, not either. But EGF is a high affinity ligand for the EGF receptor. Epigen is a low affinity ligand for the EGF receptor. It just results in different internalization kinetics of the receptor, and it gives rise to different dynamics. And so if you look again across the black traces, you see that they're fairly uh, distinct for the different growth factors. They're more similar for IGF-1 and insulin, expected, very similar receptors. EGF and epigen, exactly the same receptor, and yet distinct genetics, so still distinct dynamics. But now, if you compare the red traces and the orange traces across the different growth factors, you'll notice that they're indistinguishable. I can no longer, just by looking at these uh, temporal trajectories, say that this is likely to be uh, an activation of the EGF receptor, and this is likely to be either IGF-1 or insulin. They all look indistinguishable. And we can quantify this once again using information theory here, asking how good are the cells at resolving IGF-1 from EGF, IGF-1 from epigen, and here's a positive control in a way, IGF-1 from insulin because they're similar, so you expect that you get low uh, ability, resolving ability. And here the maximum amount in bits is 1 because two to the power of 1, 2 stimuli, it's 2. Um, and so you see that in the wild-type cells, uh, it's, there's pretty good resolving power. You can distinguish IGF-1 from EGF, IGF-1 from epigen. And now with increasing doses of endogenous expression of the PIK3CH1047R oncogene, you get progressive loss in the fidelity of information transfer, which is not the same as having the pathway on constitutively as an on switch. Instead, my sort of analogy to represent this is a sort of blurred vision. So the cells are still able to sense that they're receiving a stimulus, but th there's no ability to actually distinguish uh, what that stimulus actually is. Is it IGF, is it EGF? And particularly what we're seeing is that this loss in information uh, fidelity is down to a selective amplification of the EGF response and also an increase in the heterogeneity of the signaling response. Uh, we see this in HeLa cells and we also see this in human-induced peripheral stem cells that express only this pic 3 ca h 47 r oncogene. So there's something about the dose uh, here that matters. We've seen this uh, many times now. But also importantly, uh, there is an uncoupling. Normally you have Fairly isolated, uh, uh, fairly good isolation between the ARC RASMAP kinase of signaling pathway and PF3 kinase of signaling pathway, although they do cross talk a lot. But here we're actually seeing a loss in that uh, isolation. I'm just going to show you one final uh, plot here uh, to say, to, to demonstrate what I mean when I say increased signaling heterogeneity. Here we're looking at phospho ARC um, in single cells, human induced preferred stem cells, either wild type, heterozygous, or homozygous for H1047R. Ignore the heterozygous ones for now, uh, but if you uh, Notice the distribution, the red distributions here for the homozygous IPSC stimulated with EGF after five and 10 minutes, you will see that you get a broadening of the distribution. So not only do you see a shift in the average, but you see an amplification of the heterogeneity. And we think that this is really important for the phenotypic diversity that we also observe in cells that have the pic 3 ca h 47 r mutation. And we're currently in the process of understanding what is the mechanism that leads to the selective amplification of the RASMAP kinase signaling response downstream of EGF, but not IGF-1. And we actually do have some data in the proteomics data. And if there is time, I can... Uh, skip to those uh, slides uh, later on. Um, but for now, I think I'll wrap up. And so if you didn't get anything 
from the, all the jargon that I just went through, then there are three key messages that hopefully you can take away uh, uh, here at the end. And that is that signaling outputs are probabilistic. They're not deterministic. So you, in, especially in the presence of a pic 3 ch 47 r variant, it becomes even more difficult to predict exactly how any given cell is responding to an upstream stimulus. The second key point is that biochemical information transfer is dynamic. So signaling is about transferring information and information is encoded in, in the temporal pattern of, of the signaling response. And so that temporal pattern is really important to capture. And last but not least, um, I haven't really spoken much about this, but uh, one of the things that I'm particularly excited about in relation to these data sets is that we now have a way to think about signaling therapies of the future, which to me are the ones that will correct rather than ablate biochemical information transfer. And so we're particularly excited about modulating that uh, RASMAP kinase amplification that we're seeing with h 47 r and there are uh, new drugs out there that could potentially allow us to do that. So that's uh, what we'll be focusing on in uh, the coming months. And so um, I just want to finish by thanking um, the people who helped me um, in various ways. So this was mostly my uh, postdoc work. Um, so lots of thanks to my mentors, Barton Hinsebrook, Alex Toka, Dario Lessi, and uh, the uh, talented students that have worked with me along the way. A master's student from UCL, Trey Yin, who helped a lot with the TERP assays, and Olivia Mruk, who is my undergraduate student at the CPPU, and soon my PhD student, who's been fantastic with the finance application for the assay work. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be very happy to take questions. I have just a quick question. So um, in this model of kind of blurred instead of um, on off, so it's essentially the, the take home message that um, because it can't, there might be times where the cell needs to differentiate between these different inputs, but in the absence of the ability to do that, it's essentially the ligand with the, or, or the enzyme with the highest kind of constitutive background level that just wins out and is kind of always um, instead of being able to respond when it gets that signal or, or could you just explain that over here? So I'm just going to repeat the question for those who are on Zoom. So essentially the question is whether this is about, you know, the cells just can't resolve what, whatever signal they're getting uh, when you have the H1047R uh, variant, right? Just instead of it being on and off and that's exactly what it is. So the cells uh, do respond, but they're no longer responding specifically. So um, they are basically, uh, it's unclear for the cell what to tune into in terms of phenotypic program. So that's what we're looking at now, actually trying to understand what's the input output, sort of the transfer function, if you like. Uh, and, and what we're noticing, for example, is that they have this amplified response to EGF. So they also execute phenotypic functions that are associated with RASMAP kinase signaling and, and EGF responses when they shouldn't. Um, so. Questions? work. Um, it reminds me of uh, Michael Elowitz's paper on BMP signaling, if you're aware of that. Um, so I wonder now, um, in the context of the in vivo situation, there's not just going to be one signaling ligand present at a time. It's going to be in combination with all the other ones. So uh, how, how do you think about that? And how do you think that's affected um, by this mutation and the information transfer? Um, thanks. That's a really good question. So the question is, uh, in the in vivo setting, for example, where you have many different types of signals, you know, how will that be affected and how do we actually know uh, what's happening in vivo in the first place? So what we're actually doing is we um, uh, work together with uh, the clinicians who see the overgrowth patients. I work very closely with the overgrowth patients as well. So what we are taking out there is the tissues that are affected and we're using, among other things, we were planning to use spatial transcriptomics and uh, analyzing the microenvironment uh, that's around the mutant cells. What we actually also know is that mutant cells affect wild type cells. So you can have reprogramming of the wild type cells by the mutant cells. And that's where having access to that tissue from the patients is really important because we can identify what are the most relevant ligands that we should be looking at in our cell type of, uh, of interest. Uh, what I did mention is that these overgrowth disorders are very heterogeneous, but something that's particularly common are vascular malformations. And so what we've been able to make recently is uh, endothelial cells, specific in, um, IPSC derived venous and arterial endothelial cells. So we can model those vascular malformations in vitro and so we'll be applying types of ligands that we identify in the microenvironment of the patient tissues and sort of 
have that back and forth uh, interaction because yeah, it's very simple when you're in two D culture, but it is more complicated um, in in legal. Yeah, I I, I had a student who purified out I three four kinase uh, a long time ago, and then he was at the University of Chicago and gone back to China, but uh, I. In, when you perturb a system, the system tie, ties tries to reverse. You can't have a constantly on system because that's not good. So I wonder whether it's nothing to do with the level, but rather the oscillation. And I don't know whether you can pick that up in the data. The, the figures that you showed, I guess, were average for a lot of cells. I showed you the average of the traces, yeah. yeah but if you looked at an individual cell and come down to a, a, a small time unit, are you oh. actually seeing oscillation that's not noise, but real oscillation. You think about two systems, or I, I was trying to think of an analogy. So if you're listening to somebody playing the violin, if they just play a straight note, it isn't actually very acceptable. So the violinist will oscillate the note just a little bit. Same, same with a really good singer. So I just wonder in the cell whether it's the oscillations and not the the dimension of the change? Uh, so th this is a very good question. And we did wonder about that as well. And we are looking at, well, we can look at that because we have the single cell resolution. So we can look at the traces at very high temporal resolution. We don't see these oscillations. Uh, it, they're at least not a pervasive feature of the PS3 kinase signaling pathway. They are a pervasive feature of RASMAP kinase signaling. So that's that's very important. Map uh, RASMAP kinase signaling tends to be frequency encoded in terms of you know how it controls phenotypic outputs. What we tend to see is more of a sort of analog uh, response uh, when it is PS3 kinase signaling. What you do see, and you might have noticed that even in the average traces, is you see this kind of behavior here, you know, goes up and then it goes down, this type of overshoot. That's the type of negative feedback that you're also uh, alluding to that the system is trying to reset. Well, I was looking at your, your tremulation that in your data, whether that was real tremulation. You can. Oh, are you thinking about uh, these? No, no. If you go back to the one you had. Look at the the data. Look at the oh, population. Mm. Nah, oh, yeah. it's more of an art. Yeah, this yeah. is the this is the advantage. So people of saw this sort of thing. If you know about the cellular slime, so they sort of climb, and they have a cyclic KMP dependent mm -hmm. process, and that has a very distinct oscillation. Uh, so I think associated with calcium signaling. So uh, the so there are also like, the, there can be oscillations in PS3 kinase signaling, but they take place at a different time scale. So they're sort of like very broad oscillations, not at the level of the not 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 in the context of sort of uh, minutes. This one is particularly noisy. Uh, I. I'm tempted to believe that this is noise when you look at the actual data and the actual cells, because it's not reproducible uh, if, when you look across uh, across the traces. And the turf technology, one of the disadvantages of the turf technology is that it is more noisy and more prone to artifacts. So that's why we're complementing it with the downstream AKT approach. But I do agree that that is a partic particularly important feature of certain signaling systems, brass map kinase being one of them. Thank you very much. We can uh, open up those online questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your nice talk. Um, I have this question when you talk about the patients, uh, which tissue you study from these patients? The Or for example, you only um, talked about overgrowth syndromes. But what happened with patients with pigmentary mosaicism or hemimegalencephaly in which uh, these type of mutations have also been um, discovered? In, in which patient, sorry, the second uh, bit that you mentioned? Hemimegalencephaly. Oh, yeah. Well, so you can get megalencephaly in, in yes. so brain overgrowth yes. in, in, in these individuals as well. So that's the neuronal um, on phenotype. Um, so these, the pic 3 ca uh, overgrowth patients are mosaic which means yeah. that you have a lot of heterogeneity. Certain patients have muscle overgrowth. Certain patients have bone overgrowth. Certain patients have brain overgrowth. At the moment, what we're focusing a lot on, because it's one of the most prevalent malformations, are the vascular malformations. What's really interesting there is that you have a negative selection against the mutations in the arterial cells, 
but they're highly prevalent in the venous cells. And that's one of the reasons why we're looking now at arterial versus venous um, uh, iPSC-derived uh, endothelial cells as disease models. But ultimately, the goal is to expand to other tissues. But remember, it's a rare disease, and a lot of them are children, and it's not that easy to get tissue and it shouldn't really be from, especially brain. Okay. Uh, yeah, so. And you only get, for example, when you uh, have the sample, you only get uh, the part of the tissue which is affected, or you can get part of the tissue affected but from this. You get a lot of tissue that, so you can, you, you could get both. So we also have IPC3 reprogrammed from the patients. And so you, because it's a mosaic disease, you, you get a mixture of wild type and mutant cells. And quite often, actually, you have a massively overgrown tissue, but it may be 5% of that tissue that has cells with the mutation, suggesting that there's a lot of non-cell autonomous crosstalk, which only single cell biology can actually allow us to dissect. And that's something that we are focusing on now as well. Uh, and then we just have one question online from oh. Bori asking if um, you've looked downstream at the metabolic state to understand um, temporally and at the single cell level how information is interpreted by the signaling responses that are being uh, yeah, generated from these stimulus. Yeah, this is a really good question, especially because the pediatric RNA signaling pathway in certain circles is called the insulin uh, signaling pathway. So it's really important for metabolic regulation. The short answer is no in yet uh, in, in our particular case. Um, if anybody does single cell metabolomics, I'll be very happy to. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're interested in this kind of information encoding, uh, there are some papers from the Corolla lab in Japan who've looked at this actually in vivo. So it's not really a single cell level, but looking at pulsatile insulin secretion and glucose homeostasis. And there's some really nice, it's really nice work actually that kind of tries to get at this question. And um, we haven't. Thanks. Any other questions? All righty, let's uh, thank Rilitsa one more time.